are celebrating babies here the month of June, and one of the ways we're going to do that is through the annual baby bottle campaign that we do for Salem Pregnancy Center. You can pick up your baby bottles in the Welcome Center, or you can do it in the Connector Hall, and they look like this. They're super cute with their little pink top. And I've been collecting change all year, but if you don't have any, scrounge around in those couch cushions, or you can scan the QR code on the back of any of the promo materials, and you can give online that way, or you can write a check. However you do it, just know that a little bit of change goes a very long way. So save your change and change your life. All right, so this is our annual uh, baby bottle campaign we do for the Salem Pregnancy Care Center. So if you haven't picked up one of those baby bottles, you can get those back at the Kids Cafe. Remember to fill that up with your change. Turn that in next Sunday, or if you want to wait to the end of the month, you can turn that in at the office. I hope you'll uh, save your change. And uh, you can also go online and make a donation. Even if you don't do the change, you can go onto our website. There's a place to take you there where you can make a donation to Salem Pregnancy Care Center. We thank you for being here on this special day, Father's Day, to worship with us this morning. It's a beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, we thank you for being here in person. We have folk online as well. So glad we're all able to meet together and worship. Uh, if this is your first time to worship with us here at Tried, you're our special guest today. We have a gift for you. You can get that at our Welcome Center through these doors after the service or over to your right, my left, in the hospitality room. Pastor Rob would like to meet you this morning. We encourage you, too, to fill out a Connect card so we'll know that you were here with us today. And you can do that either of those locations, or there should be a card right in the, the chair in front of you in that pocket. If you'll take a moment to fill that out, we would greatly appreciate it. But thank you for being here to worship with us today. Now, today is uh, really a unique day because we're going to do two things this morning. We're going to celebrate our fathers and the impact and the influence they had on us uh, as their children, our earthly fathers. But we're also going to celebrate our heavenly father and what he did for us in his plan of salvation by giving us his son, Jesus Christ, who was willing to lay down his life. And we're going to observe communion this morning as well. So sort of a, two things we're going to do this morning. But I want you to join with me here. We're going to sing a couple of songs that speak about our Heavenly Father. The second verse of this song says, It tells me what my Father hath in store for every day. Stand with me. Let's sing, Oh, How I Love Jesus. There he is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells me what my Father hath in store for every day. And though I tread a darksome path, He'll sunshine all the way. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because He first loved me. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changes not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. this video.
courage and kindness, strength and gentleness, fortitude and tenderness, a father, a leader and a lifelong teacher, a comforter and a patient listener, a hero and a world changer a gift from God above. Being a father is a high and holy calling. It is not only a blessing, but also a stewardship. Fatherhood is a precious opportunity and a divine responsibility because it is one of the many ways that God watches over all of us. A father is a protector and a provider, a hard worker, and a family man, a role model, and a faithful friend. And so from all of us, to all of you, thank you to the fathers. Well, fathers, we thank you for demonstrating God's love or reflecting God's love in uh, the way you raised your children. And we want to recognize our fathers this morning. If you raised children or you had an influence or an impact on children, whether it be through fostering, adopting, uh, guardian, um, mentoring, any of those things, if you had an influence on children in any way as men, would you just stand to your feet at this moment? Stand to your feet and just stay standing for a moment. Let's give them a hand this morning as we recognize and honor them. As you continue to stand, again, we thank you for what you've done. And you know what? Most of us, a lot of us in this room, we're grandfathers, probably some great grandfathers in here, and our job's not finished. So finish well, I would say. We have a gift for you this morning. You might have already gotten it, but if not, in the Welcome Center and up in the connector area, we have a crumble cookie for you. One, please. (laughs) <laughs> Don't go to both places and get a cookie. Just one cookie between the two. And our way of thanking you, and you may be seated. Thank you so much for being here this morning. All right, Pastor Rob. All right. Congratulations, Dad. It's a wonderful day. Crumble cookie. That's a, that's a wonderful gift, isn't it? We go all out for dads here. Just want you to know. <laughs> it's amazing how dads probably don't get as much as, as uh, moms, but we're so grateful for what you've done and the impact you've had in so many lives. Um, just before our communion today, we're going to take a moment. I want to introduce someone to you. Uh, before I introduce them, let me mention, if you have not heard this, this has kind of been rumored out for the last few weeks, but it is a true rumor. Uh, Dennis Roberts is transitioning, transitioning out of full-time, uh, out of his full-time position as executive administrator. It's come to a time where he wants to pull back and go to lower than part-time. And so we are going to accommodate him with that, and we have an executive administrator we're going to bring before you that we're recommending to bring to the church. His name is Robert Steele, and I'm going to invite him to the pulpit at this time. It is a non-pastoral position. It is our executive administrator, staff support position, and uh, he has served in that role. And I just wanted him to come for about five minutes, share his testimony, and share just a little bit about his history as an executive pastor. So, Robert Steele. Thank you, Pastor. Well, it's good to be with you this morning, and I'm uh, looking forward to the opportunity, if God continues to move in that direction, that uh, I'm able to come alongside Pastor Rob and Dennis and the rest of the staff here at Tried Baptist Church and be a part of really what God has been doing here for many years now. As uh, Pastor Rob mentioned, I served at Green Street Baptist Church for 14 years, And then uh, most recently, I was at First Baptist Church, Columbia, Tennessee, and uh, right before COVID hit, and I had been traveling back and forth uh, for about 13 months, and COVID came along, and uh, nobody was traveling. So uh, I've been helping churches in the area and working in ministry and helping churches to accomplish their mission uh, through really seeing the forward vision that God has given the pastor and the leadership 
And uh, so I am excited about coming alongside and being a part of the team that God has assembled here at Triad. I want to introduce my wife to you for just a moment. Her name is Jennifer, and uh, we have been married 37 years in August. We have four adult children who are all married. We have 14 grandchildren, and uh, we're looking forward to that, uh, just continuing to raise that tribe for the glory of God. And we're thankful that uh, we are a part of a kingdom initiative that really seeks to win people for the gospel, share the gospel, and to uh, see people come to faith in Christ. So I just want to be able to introduce myself this morning and say hello to you, and I look forward to meeting you. I'll be standing here at the end of the service on the right side of the auditorium if you'd like to come by and uh, speak or ask any questions or say hello. I'd be delighted to uh, meet you this morning, but it's just so good to be with you today, and I'm excited about what God's going to do in the days to come. God bless you. All right, we want to go ahead and enter into our communion at this time. I'm going to let the deacons come, and they're going to begin to distribute the bread and the cup. Remember, they'll be together in one packet, and take the time as soon as you receive that to peel off the top so it's ready to go when we get there, because it's very difficult to peel off if you have to do it right when I say take, eat, and so we want you to be prepared for that. So go ahead and prepare yourself for that. We have open communion at this church. That means that if you're saved and you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, plus nothing, we invite you to be a part. We ask you to do one thing that I ask everyone in this room to do, to examine themselves where they are in the faith. And that means, in a sense, to just have a checkup between you and God, that you uh, literally have an open heart before God. There's nothing blocking your relationship with God, that there is an honest and truth before Him. And so this is a good time to examine yourself as they distribute the bread and the cup and to clear your heart before the Lord if there is anything. Let me just say today, communion is the foundation. It is the foundation of our deliverance. And that's a beautiful thought that God came to deliver us. His body was brutally and mercilessly beaten, violently. And then his blood was poured out as a sacrifice for our sins. Now, you need to understand we have two ordinances at this church. First of all, our union with Christ is established by baptism. You only do that one time. We baptize by immersion to symbolize Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. So your death, burial, and resurrection as well in Jesus Christ. But it is renewed by communion. That's why we do communion over and over and over again to remember to remember what Christ has done for us. It's a beautiful thing. On Friday, he died. His blood was poured out six hours on a cross. And then from 3 to 6 p.m., he was prepared by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus and put into a grave that Joseph of Arimathea, a sepulcher that he owned, he was a very wealthy man, gave to Jesus. It's the only tomb I know that someone borrowed in their death. And yet, on that Friday, he died for our sins. On Sunday, he rose from the dead. What did he do Saturday? You ever thought about that? Saturday, you say, well, he just laid in the grave. His body laid in the grave because his body died, but his spirit did not die. He would not see death in his spirit. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3 on Saturday... He's put in the grave by 6 o'clock sundown on Friday. On Saturday, 6 to 6 is how they measure their day. 6 in the evening till 6 in the morning is a night. And then the day, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. On that Saturday, the Bible says he went down and descended into the depths of Hades. And he proclaimed. He made a proclamation. He preached. He went on a ministry trip while he's dead. And he goes down there and he proclaims victory over those that are in Hades. And then he draws to himself and proclaims that Satan has lost the victory against those that have put their faith and trust in God. 
those are the Old Testament saints. That's why if you ever read your Bible carefully, Matthew 27 says, after the resurrection, the dead came out of the graves, the Old Testament saints, and walked around in the holy Jerusalem city. It's an incredible thing to think about. So he talked to spirits, these Old Testament spirits. They were trapped. They were imprisoned. Down in this place called Sheol, and Jesus Christ went to them there, and he declared, they are delivered, and Satan can no longer have a hold on them and put them as a hostage before them. And so understand that, okay? On Friday, he died. On Saturday, he delivered. And on Sunday, he rose forevermore. That's what we're doing here today. We're proclaiming the deliverance that not only they had on that Saturday, because his Saturday is your Sunday. He is out to deliver you from the power of sin, out to deliver you from the bondage of Satan. That's why we do this communion, to call you back to that again, to the deliverance he gave you through his death, burial, and resurrection. Now the Bible says, I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. This is the first time I've had to do it with a mic. It's going to be a little difficult, but I'm going to do it. He took it and he broke it. That is like the tearing of his flesh, the mutilation of his flesh. And he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. The Bible says after the same manner, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. May we all be renewed in our commitment today to experience the power of the deliverance from Satan, from sin, and from bondage in our life. And may we say to God, God, we want to do everything we can to live for you. I'll turn it back over to Scott at this time. If we have any children here who, uh, in the service who came in to participate with the, in the communion uh, and they want to go back over to the Kid Street area, we have some workers here in the back who will be glad to escort them back over there. So as we stand and sing, parents, you can take your children or send them back there and they'll take them back over to Kid Street this morning. Stand with me. Let's sing this hymn, There is a Fountain Filled with Blood.
Before Jason comes with a message this morning, we have special music from Mandy Freeman.
Some of you are going to miss that video, I have a feeling. Maybe not. You know where we're at. We're in the book of Joel this morning. Go ahead and find your place. We are in week three of a three-week series. And if you have been here for all three of those, congratulations. You're part of the true, real Christians that vacation later in the summer, I guess. Uh, but I, I want to publicly thank Pastor Rob just for the opportunity to go for three straight weeks. Um, I've really enjoyed it. Whether or not you have, I know I have. Uh, we're in the book of Joel today. One thing I wanted to mention before we get started is Steve Woodall is hosting a prayer meeting this Thursday. It's open to anybody who wants to come. It's going to be here on Thursday night in the youth room from 6.30 to 8. It's kind of floating. You don't have to be there the whole time, but if you want to come, you have something you want to pray about, uh, Steve's going to be available there uh, just to open the room and have a time of prayer. Today is the final installment of our series, Plagues and Purpose. Before you stand, before you re we read, uh, I'm going to recap a couple thoughts. Week one, Joel preached a message of ruin and rebuke, and we learned that God may allow a plague. He may even arrange one, but He will never waste it. It's not His design. There is always purpose in the plague. We learned that trusting God means that we are believing His purpose is greater than our loss. I don't understand that today. You may not understand that today. It's okay, but that's what trusting God is. It's believing that His purpose is greater than our loss. Last week, week two, Joel consecrated a solemn assembly, fasting as the people repented and returned to God. It is just like God to pursue us. No matter how far we go astray, no matter how far we wander from home, it is God's character and His nature to welcome us back with arms wide open. We are always only one step away from returning home. In that passage, he expressed grace and mercy and steadfast love and relented over disaster, just like Jesus. Today, we're going to be in Joel chapter number two. We're going to finish chapter two and move on to chapter three. But if you found your place or if you haven't, go ahead and stand to Joel chapter number two. We're going to read this morning verses 18 through 25. Joel chapter two, beginning in verse 18. Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen, but I will remove far off from you the northern army, and will drive him into a land barren and desolate, with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea. And his stink shall come up, and his ill savor shall come up, because he hath done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree, the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. The floor shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. Verse 25, and I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you. You can be seated. Thank you for standing. Today's title and installment, I have called Hello from the Other Side. We're going to continue with our outline today. You should have the first few points filled in for you. I've, I've done a little bit of that work if you've missed the previous weeks. We're going to pick up today with point number five. It's the word redemption. Redemption. Verse 18 says, Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Bible scholars suggest that some time has passed between verses 17 and 18. Uh, back when uh, we got the original manuscripts and the original autographs, they didn't really divide chapters and verses until about the 1550s. Uh, that's when they started dividing the books up into chapters and then verses. And I think the first Bible that came out was about 1560. I think that was the Geneva Bible, and it had the, the descriptions, the, the different breakdowns of the chapters and verses. They didn't consult me back in 1550 when they were doing that because I would have put a break between verses 17 and 18, because as I read it last week and as I read it today, there's a clear break between 17 and 18. A lot of Bible scholars actually suggest that some time has passed. It could have been weeks or months. Some have suggested that years passed between verse 17 when the people cry out to God and verse 18 when God answers them. 
That's kind of real life, isn't it? You ever had a prayer request and you've prayed God for this request and he answered it immediately? Maybe that's happened for you. It happens for me very infrequently. If I've asked God for a thousand things in my life, I've probably had maybe one or two answered immediately. But that's the nature of life, isn't it? We ask God for something and he rarely answers us immediately. It's always a waiting game, a little bit. We, we, we want to see how long it's going to take God to answer. He wants to see our faithfulness to Him. Anybody in this room been praying about something for a few months or a few years? Anybody? Do we pray in here? There we go. There's a few hands. Yeah. Some time has passed between the time you first prayed it and maybe the answer. Maybe it's something you're still waiting for. We want immediate answers to our prayers, but God's responses are often delayed, and it requires patience. I'll say more about that later. See what I did there? You guys aren't awake yet. It's okay. We'll get there. Here's how he would redeem Judah. He does this in a few ways. Letter A, if you're taking notes, he redeems the provisions. Redeeming the provisions. That was the first way that God would indicate to his people that there was a renewed relationship and they were back into fellowship with their God is he, was re he would redeem the provisions. Verse 19, Yea, the Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I will send you what? Corn and wine and oil, and you shall be satisfied. If you were to go back to chapter 1, verse 10, those were the three things that they had gone without. Those were the three things that had been destroyed. Corn was wasted in verse 10 of chapter 1. The new wine was dried up. The oil languishes. Uh, in verse 17, we read last week, they were made a reproach. In verse 19, he says, I will no more make a re you a reproach among the heathen. You'll be satisfied because of repentance and return. God heard the prayers of his people and he responded. It wasn't immediate. It's not immediate in our lives. It wasn't immediate in theirs. But because of repentance and return, God heard the prayers of his people and responded. It's like David said in Psalm 34, I sought the Lord and he heard me and he answered me and he delivered me from all my fears. Psalm 34 verse 6, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. It is within the character and nature of God to hear your request and ultimately answer them. It may not be in your timing and it may not be on your terms. But he's going to answer your request. It will likely not be immediate. Don't miss this principle. Deliverance and blessing would come, but not because they sought deliverance and blessing. It came because they sought God. I want to pause just for a minute to let you take that in. Deliverance and blessing would come, but not because they sought deliverance and blessing. It came because they sought God. A lot of times we, we want to see revival in our country and in our land and in our home. We want to seek revival. And sometimes we expect to see revival when we seek revival. But revival does not come when we seek revival. You know when revival comes? When we seek God. Blessing does not come when we seek blessing. Do you know when ultimate blessing comes? It comes when we seek God. Deliverance doesn't come when we seek deliverance. Deliverance comes when we seek God. The worship that you have on Sunday morning and in your heart, worship doesn't come when you seek worship. Worship comes when you seek God. So the blessing and the deliverance and what Israel and Judah got as a result of this plague, what the nation of Judah received, was not because they were looking for those things. It was because they were looking for a relationship with God. These were just a byproduct of that. The people of Judah were not after redemption. They were after relationship. And because where they failed, they repented and returned, redemption came, blessing came, deliverance came. All those came as a byproduct of the people of God seeking God. Redemption by way of blessings, deliverance, corn, wine, oil, these were a byproduct of seeking God. It was the end result, but not what they were seeking. Again, this is the gospel. It's more than redemption. It's a relationship. I'm going to step on some toes here, but it's early enough in the message that I think we can recover, okay? If you got saved just to get into heaven, you'll get there, but you'll miss much of the Christian life. You're going to miss the relationship. If you got saved just to get out of hell, you'll accomplish that, but you'll miss much of the Christian life because it's about a relationship. Uh, if you attended church just to check something off your list or just to please a spouse or somebody else, you'll accomplish that. You'll succeed, but you'll miss a lot of what the Christian life's about because it's not just about escaping hell. It's not just about going to heaven. It's not just about checking off a box and pleasing people in our lives. God is saying it's about a relationship. I want you to have a relationship with me. 
If you do those things, you'll accomplish the end, but you'll miss much of the Christian life and much of what God has in store for you in this life within the relationship with Him. This is what the gospel is. God had pity on them. He was jealous for their prayers. And because they sought a renewed relationship with Him, because they sought after Him, He said, you know what? I'm going to bless them too. I'm going to deliver them too. Verse 18, He says, His land, His people. Verse 19, Joel says his people. Twice he says, I will. This is personal. You see the per use of personal pronouns here? God is saying these are my people. This is my land. It was a personal relationship. That's what made it a personal redemption. So God redeems the provisions. That's letter A. Letter B, not only is he redeeming the provisions, letter B, he's removing the pestilence. He's removing something from them that they thought was never going to go away. Look at verse number 20. He says, But I will remove far off from you the northern army. I will drive them into a land barren and desolate. The northern army, the ESV calls this the northerner. Some have suggested a dual purpose in this statement. Literally, Joel was referring literally to the locusts. He was referring to the great army of the locust plague that had descended upon the nation of Judah. That's the literal translation. But Bible commentators also suggest that there was a metaphorical reason behind that too because it wasn't just the literal army of the locusts, it was also uh, foreshadowing the literal army of the Assyrians coming down from the north that would someday come and, and attack the nation of Judah and take them captive. So the Assyrians hadn't come yet, but they would eventually. And what God is saying to Joel here is, the locusts came and I'll remove them. And when the northern army, the Assyrians come, I'll remove them too. This storm is over, but more storms will come. I wish I could tell you today that the storm that you're facing, this is the worst that it's going to get. And it's the worst storm you're ever going to face in your life. And once you get through this one, it's going to be smooth sailing for here. I wish I could tell you that. But what Joel is saying to the people of Judah is, this storm is ending, but another storm will come. Because other storms always come. Other storms always pop up. They always come. There will be more storms. There will be more struggles and more pandemics and more trials and more sickness and more plagues and more locusts. But when you'll seek me with all your heart as you did here, and I redeemed you here, I will also do it then as well. Because I'm your God. I'm your portion. I'm here for you. The enemy you're facing today has done great things. He says, but keep in mind, I have too. Verse 21, fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Don't just look at the enemy. Look who it is that's in your corner fighting for you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Paul said, there is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted. Above that you're able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You ever heard somebody say, God won't put anything on you that you can't handle? It's not in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is though. And God frequently will put things on you that you can't handle. You can't go through it alone. You can't do it by yourself so that our dependency is now on Him. There's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. He won't suffer you to be tempted above that year able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you can be able to bear it. He does that with his power living inside of us. Letter C, rejoicing through patience. Redeeming the provisions, we're removing the pestilence, but God also says, I want you to be rejoicing through patience. Verse 21, he says, Fear not, O land, be glad, rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, beast of the field. Uh, verse 23, be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. God's love, this is a, a quote by Craigie, which is one of the commentators that I read after. Uh, Peter Craigie said this, God's love always con continued always for his people, but as they turned from him, it was manifest in wrath. As they turned back to him, seeking again the intimate relationship that had been lost, they rediscovered the compassion that was always in the heart of God. It was always there. It was just manifest in anger when they were turning from Him, but it manifests itself in compassion as they turned back to Him. They could rejoice today because they were on the other side 
of the locust. Uh, in my life, I, I faced things before. I, I'm only in my mid 30s. Some of you have faced a lot more than I have. But when I'm over on this side of a storm, it gets intense. And maybe this is where you're at at your point in your life, at your storm, is you're here at the beginning point of a storm. And it, it stinks and it's no fun. It's not fun for you. It's not fun for the people that are around you that are trying to encourage you. Like it is no fun for anyone because you are at the beginning of a storm. Maybe some of you, you're at this stage over here and you've been at this for some time and you look back and you say, well, things weren't the way they were then, but man, now it doesn't seem to be much better. I hope I'm at the tail end of the storm. You can't see the end of the storm, but you're in the thick of it. You're in the middle of it. What Joel is saying is at some point, you're going to be on the other side of the storm. It could be today, it could be this week, it could be in a few months or a couple years, but at some point you're going to be here looking back at the storm you faced and you're going to say, you know, I, don't, I didn't know what you were doing back in 2008, but I get it today. I didn't know what, I didn't know what you were doing back in 2015 when I lost my job or, or when my, my spouse left or when someone I loved died. I didn't understand it then, but I understand it now. God, I didn't understand what you were doing in 2020 when the world fell apart. I, I didn't get it then, but I get it now because now I can see from the other side of the storm. And Joel is trying to say to us, I, I want you to think about what's on the other side. Because Joel can see the future. Joel's the prophet who can see what God is doing. And he says, I want you to know I'm on the other side. It's going to be okay. You're in the middle of it. It's fine. You're at the beginning of it. You're about to get through it. But I'm on the other side of the storm. I'm on the other side of the plague. And you're going to be able to get through it. That's what Joel is telling the people of Judah. Is you're going to get through this. I want you to rejoice through patience. Fill in the blank. Let me know if you've ever heard this popular quote before. Blank heals all wounds. What's the word? Time. That's the correct answer. Is it true? No. It's not. It's not true. Time heals all wounds. It's not even close to being true. One writer said this, time alone brings no healing, but God does. And he uses time, patience, to trap us in his restoring process. Time alone heals nothing, but God combined with time can. You ever let some time go by? I remember um, a couple times in my life I've had an injury, and I let some time go by thinking that uh, you can just walk it off, you know, shake it off. And sometimes I have, and other times I've had to go to the ER for something, you know, because you can't shake it off. Time doesn't heal all wounds. You ever thought you were through a hurt? You, you had gone past it, you had moved your way through it, and a couple years has gone by, and you thought, I'm over it. Everything's okay. Time healed that wound. And then somebody's name comes up, and you're, you're transported back to that time in your life, and you realize it still hurts. Because time alone doesn't heal anything. Uh, Spurgeon said this, you cannot have back your time but there is a strange and wonderful way in which God can give you back wasted blessings of years you mourned. Patience and waiting build strength. And when you get to the other side, you can look back and say, I get it. I, I sure didn't like it. I didn't enjoy it. I, I wouldn't go back and do it again. But I wouldn't change it for anything now that I'm on the other side of this storm. Now that I'm on the other side of this plague. That's what God is beginning to do in Joel's day, and he seeks to do the same for us. Redemption. Number two, or number six, restoration. It's redemption, now it's restoration. I love this point. Redemption is what saves you, but restoration is what brings back all that was lost. Restoration is what saves you. Or redemption is what saves you, but restoration brings back all that was lost. I'll tell you a story. Let's say, this is completely hypothetical. Let's say that uh, I have a $100 bill. And I have a $100 bill, and my wife sends me to Walmart to pick up $100 worth of stuff. Okay? So I got my $100 bill, I put it in my pocket. And I go to Walmart, 
and I, I get a cart, and I get all the stuff that she's got on her list. And man, I'm excited. I'm crossing stuff off the list. I'm putting stuff in the cart. And then uh, I've got my $100 worth of stuff. And then I go to the checkout line. Now, I don't go to the self-checkout line. I actually go to a, a register. You know why? Because I have $100 worth of stuff. I don't know who needs to hear this today, but if you've got $100 worth of stuff at Walmart, you don't need to go to the self-checkout and clog the line. Just go to a cashier. Let them help you out, okay? This is, this is good principle anyway. So I go to, the, I go to the, the cashier, and she rings up all my stuff. And she says, wow, you planned this really well, or your wife did. This is exactly $100 even. Never seen that before. And I said, that's great. I got my $100 bill. I reach into my pocket. I can't find it anywhere. Like, I'm, I'm pulling out pockets. I'm looking everywhere. I can't find my $100 bill. And you know who's behind me in line in Walmart? It's Norman Hamilton. He's right there behind me in line. Hey, Norman. And Norman says, hey, Jason, what's going on? And I said, well, you wouldn't believe it. I said, I had a $100 bill in my pocket. My wife sent me here to get $100 worth of stuff, and I can't find my $100 bill. So the cashier's like, hey, sir, I mean, do you have a credit card? Do you have a debit card? Do you, do you have Apple Pay? Do you have anything you can pay with here? And I said, I, I got nothing. I, I had a $100 bill. And Norman says, you know what? I got it. Norman swipes his card. Lady gives me my receipt. And I said, Norman, thank you for doing that. I'll pay you back. He said, forget about it. I wanted to do it. It was a hundred bucks. What's that between friends? And Norman, thank you for being as generous as you've been to take care of my groceries. Yes, thank you, Norman. So I'm, I'm, I'm walking to my car. I got all my bags. I put them in the car and I'm thinking, man, I'm really glad that Norman was there. I don't know what I would have done, but I'm still bummed that I lost that hundred bucks. I don't know what happened to it. So, so I, I get my groceries in the car and I start driving down the road and I get to a stoplight. I'm halfway home and uh, I look in the floorboard and there's my $100 bill. I see it. So redemption is what happened in Walmart, but restoration is what happened in the car. So in that process, not only did I get $100 worth of stuff, I also got to keep my $100 bill. I've tried to pay Norman, but he won't take it. He said, no, man, it's on the house. That'll be a good sermon illustration one day. That's what, that's what it was. That's redemption and restoration. Redemption happened in the store because I was saved and I was able to get all my stuff. But restoration gives me back everything that I lost at another point. That's what God is trying to explain to the nation of Judah here. He said it's, it's more than just redemption, it's restoration. Redemption saves you, but restoration brings you back all that was lost. It's the former rain and the latter rain, and you're getting it all at once in the first month. Look at verse 24. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the vat shall overflow with wine and oil. What began as devastation will ultimately end in deliverance. God says, you're devastated now, and I understand it. But when you get to the other side, you're going to understand. This is who God is. It's always his desire to give us grace and mercy and compassion and blessing. Like in verse 23, it says, you're, you're going to get your rain in the latter month and in the first. You're going to get your early and latter rain, and I'm going to do it in the first month. I'm not going to wait, make you wait for the entire season. I've shorted you some rain. You've had the plague. You've had droughts. You've had fire. I'm going to give you all the rain, the early and the latter rain here in the first of the month. Your vats will be full and overflowing. How many times do we choose a life of average when God wants us to live in abundance? I'm not talking about financial abundance. I'm not talking about physical abundance with good health. He wants us to walk with him in spiritual abundance. He wants to have a relationship. The God of the universe wants to have a relationship with you. I don't understand that. Because as I, as I stand here and look at you, there's some of you that I think to myself, God wants to have a relationship with them? Really? I mean, I, I understand him wanting to have a relationship with me, but he, he wants to have a relationship with Alan too? He wants to have a relationship with each and every one of us? He does. That's what God is. That's who he is. That's what he does. He wants to have a relationship with us, and he wants us to walk in spiritual abundance, yet many times we settle for average. I'm going to get to verse 25, but before I do, I want you to understand that before I read verse 25, this is the hallmark verse of everything Joel says. If you do your math, Joel wrote 73 verses of Scripture. Week one I thought was kind of bleak, and I wanted to share verse 25 with you then, but I, I held off. Last week, I really wanted to push through and get to verse 25, but I didn't. I held off. Now, here it is. We're going to get to verse 25. 
This is the hallmark passage of Joel's book and really his entire life. There are 31,000 verses in the Bible. Joel got to write 73 of them. You do the math, that's less than a quarter of a percent. And his whole life was summed up. His central theme, his entire message is summed up in verse 25. Look there. God says to Joel to say to the people, And I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you. A literal Hebrew rendering of verse 25 reads like this, I will pay you back for the years I took. I'm going to pay you back. I'll pay you back for the years the locust took. And I read that and I think, you couldn't possibly. You couldn't possibly pay me back for what I've been through. You couldn't possibly pay me back for the trials and the storms and the things that I've lost. It's more than just financial. It's more than just paying me back. I've lost time. I've lost years. I've lost seasons of my life. You couldn't possibly pay me back for that. A couple weeks ago, I was reading a few stories of wrongful sentencing in our court system, and I want to read this one to you. This happened a few years ago. There's a man named Steve Titus who was 30 years old, a native of Seattle. He was engaged to be married back in 2013. This happened about a decade ago. Steve Titus was driving home from dinner one night, and he was pulled over because his car resembled another car matching the description of a man who had raped a female hitchhiker earlier that night. Local police stopped him, asked him where he was at, where he was going. He said, I just got back from dinner. They said, well, your, your car matches the description of a car we've been looking for, um, but it doesn't meet the description completely. And he said, okay. He said, I'm going to take a picture of you and uh, take your license and registration information and we'll call you if we need anything. Police officer took Steve Titus's photo. Local police took his picture and added it to a lineup. The rape victim, several days later, pointed at Steve Titus's picture, and she said, quote, that one is the closest. That's what she said. On the witness stand, Steve Titus was brought in, and the victim said, as she saw him, she pointed at him, and she said, that's him. I think that's him. Steve Titus had an alibi. He had witnesses. There was no physical evidence linking him to the crime, but he was convicted and sentenced to prison. Behind bars, Steve Titus hired an investigative journalist. This guy that he hired followed the evidence and actually tracked down the offender, but it took about five years. Can you imagine being in prison for five years for a crime that you did not commit? I couldn't imagine being in prison for a week for a crime that I didn't commit. Steve Titus was there for five years. There are laws in 36 states that provide money to exonerees averaging about $50,000 a year for each year served in prison for wrongful sentencing. I'm not great at math. I went to Bible college, but five years at $50,000 a year comes out to 250 k That's a quarter of a million dollars. I, I don't know what kind of financial situation you've got in the room, but I could use a quarter of a million dollars. Maybe some of you could as well. I, I could think of some things that I could do with a cool quarter of a million dollars today. But would anyone here take that kind of payout in exchange for five years in a federal prison for a crime you didn't commit? Um, 250K is a lot of money. But in exchange for the next five years of my life, not a chance. If I were arrested today and I took that deal, I would get out in June of 2028. My Sophia, who's three, would be eight years old. Zoe would be in the youth group, and Ethan would be about to get his license. You want me to trade those five years for that? I can't, I can't come up with a sum. I, I can't give you an amount of money that I would trade to give up the next five years of my life. Following Steve Titus's release, he died shortly after due to a stress-related heart attack, and his family was awarded a settlement. I tell you that story because of this. You can pay me back financially for stuff I've lost in the past. You, you, can, you can make me whole again. You can be restored for a lot of things. But time, wasted years, I, I couldn't get that back. If I went to prison today for the next five years for something I didn't do, I, I wouldn't be able to get it back. 250K would not touch the damages that would be done. So when God says, I will pay you back 
I think you can't possibly pay me back for what I've lost. You could pay me back in money. You could pay me back in experience and reward, whatever. But time? I don't understand that. How does he restore the promise? The short answer is, I don't know. I wish I could give you a better answer than that. I don't know. I I think it's going to be different for me how he restores me than how he restores you. It's going to be different how he restores the church with how he restores Israel. It's going to be different for everybody in this room. I can't explain the how and when and where and what he will do to restore you, but based on his word, he will restore you in his timing and on his terms. I want life to happen in my timing. I want it to be on my terms, and God doesn't operate that way. But Jason, my marriage failed. We're divorced. He promises restoration. I don't know how. I can't explain that. But my dreams died. I can't go back in time. He promises restoration. But I said what I said, and I did what I did. But he promises restoration. But my children are grown. I can't raise them again. Can't go back in time and start over. He promises restoration. But my loved one died. I prayed for them to get better. I thought you were going to heal them, and they're dead. They've been dead for years. How do you heal that? I don't know. But he promises restoration. He promises restoration in his timing and on his terms, and we don't get to choose that. There's prayer requests right now that I'm asking God for, and if it was in my timing, it would have happened already. Anybody else thinking that? I'm asking God for something. If it was in my timing, it would have happened by now. If it was on my terms, this this would already be done. But you're not God, and I'm not either. And it's according to his timing and his terms. We don't get to choose those, but he promises restoration. In my study of this book, I read some of these verses that Joel wrote, and some of them, I read it, and I understood it immediately. There were other verses I read, and I had to dig a little bit, and there's some, as we'll get to in chapter 3, that still don't make a lot of sense to me. But verse 25 is the verse that I read the most, and I probably read it 20 times before this particular concept jumped off the page. I was focused on three words in verse 25. I will restore. It's where my focus went. It's where the whole point I just preached came from is I will restore. But I want you to look at three other words. Verse 25, and I will restore you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm. Look at the next three words. My great army. Look at the three words after that. Which I sent. Are you following this? Do you realize what that means? That means that God sent the locusts to the nation of Judah. Uh, We said back in the beginning, he may allow it. He may even arrange it, but he's not going to waste it. You just thought maybe this was something that happened to pass through the filter of God in your life, and he allowed it to come. He was the orchestrator behind the locust plague. He is the one that sent the locusts. They were his army, my great army, which I sent. Could it be that in your life, the plague that you're going through is something that God also sent? It wasn't until the 20th reading of this verse that I realized God was behind the whole thing. He who could have destroyed your storm actually designed it. Listen to this Spurgeon quote. I'll never never steal a a Spurgeon sermon. You'll know that it didn't come from me the way that he writes. Listen to this quote by Spurgeon. Winter in the soul is by no means a comfortable season. And if it be upon thee just now, it will be very painful to thee. But there is this comfort, namely, that the Lord makes it. He sends the sharp blasts of adversity to nip the buds of expectation. He scatters the hoarfrost like ashes over the once verdant meadows of our joy. He casteth forth his ice morsels, freezing the streams of our delight. He does it all. He is the great winter king and rules in the realms of frost and therefore thou canst not murmur. Losses, crosses, heaviness, sickness, poverty and a thousand other ills are of the Lord's sending and they come to us with wise design. I didn't send it your way. God didn't just allow it to come. In many cases, he sent it because he knows you need to go through it. He's shaping you into the image of Jesus who he wants you to be and he knows you can't do it on your own. So he offers relationship. He offers to help us as we go through it. He who could have destroyed your storm actually designed it. Verse 26, And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God. 
that dwelt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. Regardless of what stage in the storm that you're in, it likely doesn't make sense to you today. It's not supposed to, but he closes out this theme. I'm in the midst. I'm your portion. I'm your God. I'm right here with you. This is a further reminder that he will restore his promise. Let her be relying on purpose. Restoring the promise and now relying on purpose. Verse 28 begins with, it it will come to pass afterward. I want to explain this to you. Verses 18 through 27 are immediate future. Verses 28 to 29 are distant future, and verses 30 to 32 are far distant future. So I want you to think about that as we read these verses. This is immediate future, distant future, far distant future. Look at verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants I will pour upon the handmaids in those days I will pour out my spirit. I will show wonders in heaven and the earth, blood and fire, pillars of smoke, the sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. What he's saying in these verses, I'm going to pour out all flesh. That was distant future. Immediate future up till verse 27, but now in verse 28, this was distant future. This was going to be fulfilled at Pentecost. So Jesus died and was resurrected, and then he was seen by 40, uh, for 40 days among many witnesses. And then on Pentecost, which means 50, it was a 50-day post-Passover, at the day of Pentecost, Jesus has already been ascended. Peter preaches. Do you know what his text is? Joel chapter 2. Peter preaches in Acts chapter 2 a message from Joel chapter 2, and we see the partial fulfillment of what Joel is talking about, what God laid out. This is the outpouring of the Spirit. It would not be for Jews only, but for all of us. The gospel would be all-inclusive. It's not according to race or ethnicity or social class or education or gender or languages. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then far distant future, verses 30 to 32. This is in reference to the end times. Again, the day of the Lord is referenced. This is far distant distant future. It was future to them then. It's still future to us now because it's still coming. It's going to be in the future. Far distant future, verses 30 to 32. The plague in Joel's day was sent by God, but it had a purpose that extended beyond Joel 800 years later to Pentecost and 2,800 years at least later to past us. Again, trusting God means we are believing that his purpose is greater than our loss. I cannot make sense of that for you today, but in time, it will make sense. Number five is redemption. Number six is restoration. Number seven, chapter three is all about remembrance. It's all about remembrance. I don't have time to properly develop all of chapter three. We're going to sprint through it. I'll do my best. Memory is a funny thing. It's funny in my life, it's funny in yours. There are things that I remember in vivid detail, and I could tell you everything about them that happened two decades ago. And there's other things I can't remember from last week. It's weird how memory works, Uh, but that's the way that it is. Joel is an obscure prophet. He came out of nowhere. Then he jumps onto the scene, writes 73 verses, and then drifts back into obscurity. He wants us to remember four things. So what God does through Joel is he leaves Judah and he leaves us with four reminders. These are four things I want you to remember, Joel, in this locust plague. Number one, remember my power. Remember my power. Verse one of chapter three, for behold in those days and in that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. They have cast lots for my people and have given a boy for a harlot and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. He says, remember my power. You remember what I did with those little grasshoppers? Those are bugs. Imagine what I can do with my full fury of judgment. The valley of Jehoshaphat, the name Jehoshaphat means the Lord judges. This is the Kidron Valley. 
This is a picture that I took earlier this year. As I'm standing here, I'm on the Mount of Olives, and directly in front of me is a Jewish cemetery. And then you see the Kidron Valley. That's all the green. And between the Kidron Valley and the Eastern Wall, there is a Muslim cemetery because the Muslims believe that Jesus is coming back, and he's going to stand on the Mount of Olives, and he's going to make his way through the Eastern Gate. And because it's against Jewish custom to touch a dead body or a dead Muslim, they think that their graveyard is going to stop him from coming. Newsflash, it's not. The valley, Kidron Valley, right here is the Valley of Jehoshaphat, and that's where the ultimate day of the Lord will take place. This is where it's going to happen. It's also where Israel and Judah will once again be fully restored to God. Look at verse number four. Yea, and what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon, the coast of Palestine? Will you render to me recompense? And he tells them, verse 5, because you've taken my silver and my gold, you've carried it to your temples, my goodly things, the children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem. Ye have sold unto the Grecians that ye might remove them far from their border, but I will raise them out of the place whither ye have sold them and will return your recompense upon your head. I will sell your sons and daughters into the hand of the children of Judah and they shall see them to the Sabians, be a people far off for the Lord has spoken. He said, I'm gathering all my people together. I'm gathering them together. Uh, when I was in Israel earlier this year, uh, some of the tour guides were telling me there's people in America and Europe and all over the world that are of Jewish descent that haven't lived in Israel for generations. You know what they're doing? They're moving back to Israel. Some of them can't even tell you why they're moving back to Israel because the Jews knew their heritage. They knew what tribe they were from. But in 70 AD, when they were ransacked and all their records were wiped out in 70 AD, a lot of Jews today know that they're Jews, but they can't tell you most of them what tribe they're from. But God knows what tribe they're from. And in the tribulation, 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe are going to accept Christ because he knows each and every one of them, who they are, where they came from, and what they're going to do with Jesus in that day. He says, I want you to remember my power, let her be, remember my patience. Remember my patience. For generations, God was patient with his people. Just read through the Old Testament. For generations, ever since Jesus, he's been patient with us and our world, but his patience will not last forever because future judgment is coming. Verse 9, proclaim ye this among the Gentiles, prepare war, make up mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears, like the wheat say I am strong, assemble yourselves and come, all the heathen gather yourselves together round about thither, cause my mighty ones to come down, O Lord, let the heathen be weakened. The exploiters and the oppressors will one day see their deeds haunt them. You ever wonder why there's so many injustices in the world today and people seemingly get away with everything? God says, hey, not for long. It's not always going to be that way. A day of reckoning, a day of judgment is coming. He who is patient will not always be patient. Look at verse number 13. He says, put in a sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full, the vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, their stars will withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and earth shall quake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people. All the translators seem to agree on this rendering of the valley of decision. Um, I've heard it preached before. Make your decision to turn to Jesus today. It's a time of decision, but it, it doesn't fit the context. These are enemy nations of God that have gathered for final war on Judgment Day, and by this point, they've already made their decision. Wearsby says this, to make the valley of decision a place where lost sinners decide to follow Christ is to twist the scripture. It is God who makes the decision, and his decision or decree here is to judge and not save. The nations have had their opportunity. Now is too late. He says, remember my power. Remember my patience. Let her see. Remember my presence. Remember my presence. The second half of verse 16. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. This verse has implication not only for Old Testament Jews living in Judah, but also for New Testament believers in our day. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed. Remember, even in bad times and oppression and war and debt and drought and storms and struggles, my presence is always with my people. He calls us his portion. There's possession. They chose retribution. They chose retaliation. They chose rebellion. But you chose relationship. 
So he says, I'm not just offering you an escape from the judgment to come. I'm offering you more than blessing, more than deliverance, more than refuge. I offer you myself. Remember my power and my patience and my presence. Letter D and we're done. He says, remember my promise. Verse 17, so shall ye know that I am the Lord your God. Here's how you know. My holy mountain shall Jerusalem be holy. There shall no, there, there shall no strangers pass through her anymore. In Joel's day, their province lacked the ability to exclude foreigners. Everybody that was a foreigner that came through Judah got to stay. Historically, in the conquest of Jerusalem by the Babylonians, they were once strangers in their own land. You feel like a stranger in 2023? I know I do. I feel like a weirdo sometimes watching TV. I can't watch anything. I can't eat anywhere. I can't shop anywhere. It's 2023. It's a weird time. I feel like a stranger here. I've lived here my whole life. God says it's not going to always be that way. You're not going to always feel like a stranger or an exile in a deserted land. What Joel is saying here is one day you will never again be strangers. I am your God. That's my promise to you. Verse 18, it shall come to pass in that day that the mountain shall drop down new wine. The hills shall flow with milk. All the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters and the fountain shall come forth out of the house of the Lord. Egypt shall be a desolation. Edom shall be desolate wilderness for the violence against the children of Judah because they have shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall dwell forever and Jerusalem from generation to generation. For I will cleanse their blood. I have not cleansed for the Lord dwells in Zion. Zion is the temple mount where Solomon's temple once stood. It's a mosque today. I think I have a picture of that. This is a picture of the mosque that stands on the temple mount. What God is saying to Joel, in that day, the temple of God will stand again. In that day, Egypt and Edom and all of your enemies will be wiped out. In that day, Judah will dwell forever. I will avenge the wrongs. I will bring justice. Joel begins the book with getting our attention, but he closes it with affirmation. Joel says, God gave me a vision and you can't see it now. But one day I'm going to redeem you. One day I'm going to repay you. One day I'm going to restore you for all that the locusts destroyed. I'm out of time and I'm out of text, but I got to, I got to tell you one more thing. The series would not be complete if I don't tell you this because I found this this week. I read this story in an issue of Modern Farmer online. I'm not a subscriber, so I read it online. This is a story from March of 2023. If you guys could show that picture of the, the farmer, that last photo. I love the video ending with this. This is a quote from the magazine. Following a multi-year locust plague, organizers in Kenya are making the most of the swarm. Running from 2018 to early 2022, a massive locust outbreak hit Eastern Africa and the Middle East and destroyed hundreds of thousands of acres of crops, denying food to three million people. So you're telling me in the midst of COVID, 2018 to early 2022, in the midst of the global pandemic, the continent of Africa, who was the most ill-equipped to handle a pandemic like that, also had a locust plague for four years? Yeah, that's how modern this story is. It spanned four years. Here's what the article says. Research on desert locusts has revealed they have a rich composition of nitrogen and other macronutrients that enrich the soil to help crops grow back better than before. Using this approach, which is what the man's holding, dead locusts to fertilize the ground, not only does it enrich the ground to grow better than it ever has before, but it also deters future swarms of locusts because they're attracted to areas with low nitrogen levels in their soil. Do you know what I would tell this man as we close this series, as he holds the dead locust in his hands? You know what I would tell this guy? You know what I would tell you? Here, here's where I want to end. The plague that you're facing in your life today, it's devastating. And there is no doubting that. But essentially, God seeks to use it for your good. He, he seeks to enrich the soil of your life with the very plague that tried to destroy you. He's on the other side, and he's looking back at us. He has a purpose in your pain that involves those same locusts that plagued you to be a catalyst for his perfect plan in your life. Joel says, you may not be able to see it now, 
but those locusts that tried to destroy you, I'm going to use those in your life to do something you could have never imagined on your own. I have a purpose and I have a plan that you don't get it today. But on the other side, you will. He's redeeming, he's restoring. Joel says to us as he closes his book, after the locust, you are in for a harvest that can never be taken away from you. Do you know why? Because there's purpose in the plague. Let me ask you to have your heads bowed and eyes closed just for a moment today. We're going to pray in just a minute. I am aware that there are a lot of hurts in this room. There's people that are dealing with things that I don't know about and that I probably wouldn't understand even if I did know. It's possible that you're here today and your whole life has been a plague because you've been separated from God to this point in your life. You're separated from him. You've tried to fill that void with everything imaginable and nothing has helped. Salvation is not a membership, it's a relationship. Jesus invites you to come today to join a relationship with him, not to add him to what you've already got, but to redeem you, to replace those things. Those of you today who are followers of Jesus, you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel because of all the locusts in your life. You cannot change the plagues, but in the plagues, God can change you. He has a purpose in your pain that involves the very same locust that plagued you. He wants it to be a catalyst for his perfect plan in your life. He's on the other side. He's restoring, he's redeeming, he's making all things new. And after the locust, you're in for a harvest that can never be taken away from you. God has purpose in the pain because he has purpose in the plague. God, I pray that you would take these thoughts from your servant Joel and minister to us even today. God, if there is people in this room that you seek to redeem and you seek to restore, I pray that today would be a day of healing for them. Lord, as you sit on the other side of our struggle and on the other side of our pain, I pray that we would trust you to use these locusts in our lives for good and for your plan. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me, if you will, all over the room. We're going to sing an invitation song. The altar's open. Feel free to come if you have a need. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. I will not falter. I will not faint. He is my shepherd. I am not afraid. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. He will uphold me all of my days. I am surrounded. accessible, so I just thought I'd stay up here. Hey, I appreciate you guys' attention today. I know it went a little bit over. Let's dismiss in a word of prayer. Father, we love you, and we're thankful so much for your goodness to us, even in the storms and the struggles of life. God, I pray that we would trust you with it, that you would use the things that we're going through to your glory and our good, even though we may not see it today. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.